So welcome to the second keynote speaker and the second day of the conference. This is how we open the second day of the Winier uh, 2022 conference. And I would like to uh, thanks once, thank once again uh, Professor Harini Nagendra for being here with us. Harini is Professor of Sustainability and Director of the Center for Climate Change and Sustainability at Asim Premji University in India. Her research examines human nature interactions in forests and cities from the perspective of sustainability, yeah. ecology, and justice. She's the author of Nature in the City, Bengaluru in the Past, Present, and Future, and co-editor of the Routledge Handbook of Urban Ecology. Professor Nagendra was awarded the Cozzarelli Prize by the U.S. National Academy of Sciences in 2009 and the Eleanor Ostrom Senior Scholar Award for Collective Governance of the Commons in 2013. The title of her talk, of her talk today will be Governing Forests and Cities in the Anthropocene, the Importance of Polycentricity. I, for one, am very much looking forward to your speech and well, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Georgina. Thank you, David. Thank you, everyone from Vinir. And it's a real pleasure to be here and to talk to a somewhat different community about ideas that I have. Uh, so it, it's been nice for me to return to ideas of polycentricity because these days I'm doing something that is aligned but not exactly on polycentricity. So without uh, further, uh, let me just jump straight in. So to begin with, uh, I think we're all very aware that we're in an era, unlike anything else, uh, the era of climate change, the era of the urban, the era of the Anthropocene, indeed, uh, even geologists now agree this is an era where uh, human impacts are reshaping the earth completely, changing forests, changing infrastructure, changing rivers, changing water systems, changing the very air we breathe and the very climate we live in. As I speak to you, I'm just, uh, I was not sure two days ago that I could actually make it because Bangalore is uh, facing unprecedented, unprecedented rainfall, which along with bad governance has led to flooding in the entire area around. Uh, in a layout near mine, there were boats coming in to rescue people in the middle of the night because in a city, in a landlocked city, because there were six, seven feet of water. A number of people that I know had to leave their homes. Some have died because they couldn't get the medical care in time. The rain gods have been kind today and it's there's no thunder no lightning and it seems okay but but yes it's 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 uh, it is the era of the anthropocene let us say that that has come home to me much more in the past five days than it has ever been it's much more an emotional uh, a, a daily life experience than than something that i've been academically working on so we live in the era of the anthropocene and we have major human transformations of the land surface that we have been experiencing across the world for over the past at least two to three hundred years certainly since colonial expansion took across took over across the world we've been seeing forests disappear ecosystems getting reshaped rivers getting restructured with large dams changing flows delta sinking and one of the standard responses over the past 40 50 years definitely since garrett hardin but also a little before that has been to establish protected areas. So global protected areas cover significant parts of the world and are increasing everywhere. And this follows, uh, of course, a seminal paper by Hardin, but also work by others such as John Muir and many other people in different parts of the world with the idea that uh, change is happening because uh, people are, uh, the area of the Anthropocene, uh, it does not very clearly define who is the Anthropos. And if the Anthropos is people and the people are local communities, which is normally considered to be, as Hardin in fact said, so then there's a tragedy of the commons and you should need to throw the people out and get a strong force in it. What is that strong force? Usually the government or the market or the private interest. It's never, occasionally it's in some cases it's the community, but it's always there is one answer, right? So we see a world where there's massive conversion of forests and rural areas. We see rapid urbanization and industrialization. We see huge changes in social ecological systems. And one of the things I've been very interested in looking at is what are the kinds of governance or institutional conditions that facilitate human action for either positive change or negative change? Because we all recognize that it's not all doom and gloom. Otherwise, we would have given up 
and they've done something else. There is always a hope for change. And I think we're here searching for that optimism, that hope for change. So what are the institutional conditions that facilitate or restrict the human actions for positive or negative changes is something that is a core interest of mine. In that, I have been greatly influenced by Eleanor Rostrom's work. As you can see on the bottom right side, she, she is in a lake in Bangalore, and I will show another photograph of hers later, planting a jackfruit tree uh, at the site of the lake, uh, which still stands. So what is polycentric governance, and why does it become important when one is studying the factors that shape human action or what, what shifts positive or negative change. It's best contrasted or most usefully contrasted with the idea of monocentric governance. Like what is monocentric governance? And polycentricity is, is, a, is a term of its own. I realized when I was sitting in an IPCC uh, uh, discussion uh, in a working group that was looking at cities, that urban scholars call, these multi, call this multi-level governance. And for them, polycentricity simply means a number of cities in a metropolitan region. And since then, you know, polycentricity is a word that is used in a number of disciplines and means different things to different scholars. So polycentricity in our institutional uh, view of um, the world can be looked at as multi-level governance. And in that sense, how do you contrast it? You contrast it with the various solutions that are proposed for problems of environmental resource governance, whether it's climate change, have the Kyoto Protocol, you'll fix everything or it's air pollution, let's say the, the ozone layer, you have the Montreal Treaty, it's all fixed. Or it is a, a biodiversity collapse, expand the protected area network. So there's always one solution. Or if it's carbon credits right now, so the market will step in and take care of the carbon problem. So it's the government, the market, and occasionally when the World Bank steps in or the UNDP steps in or other kinds of global funding step in, it's the community. And there are problems with each of these approaches. So uh, in the rest of my talk, I'll speak about forests using some examples, and I'll speak about cities using some other examples from my work to give you a sense of why a polycentric lens is helpful in understanding uh, these problems in more detail. And a lot of this depends on uh, the uh, Elner Rostrum social ecological systems framework. So what does this tell us? This tells us that any governance system that we're looking at is at the core, that is the actual situation. You have a set of interactions. Maybe human beings come and cut down trees and that leads to outcome of deforestation or maybe human beings plant trees and protect a forest and that leads to protection and regrowth and biodiversity change. So you have this action situation where uh, interactions lead to outcomes. And at the same time, uh, what you have is a number of nested systems at a different level that are higher to this, that shape this. And that is why it's called multi-level governance. So the resource system, whether it's a forest or a lake, or a, you know, a large lake or a small lake, what kind of a resource system is it? Is it a tropical forest which regenerates very quickly? Then maybe users are much more motivated because when you actually protect this forest, you see regrowth in five years. Or is it a dry tropical system which is really degraded and requires 50 years to regrow? Then maybe people lose motivation. So the nature of the resource system is important. What about the resource units themselves? Are they fish? They're easier to count and say that everyone gets so many fish or everyone gets so many trees. If it's water, it gets far more problematic because what if you say everyone can pollute the liver this much? And you're in industry, okay, you can pollute so much. But everybody gets the polluted water as downstream. So you see, water is much more difficult to govern than it is to take fish out of our water. To govern pollution becomes a much more complicated uh, issue. So what is the nature of the resource services that it provides? What are the nature of the resource units it provides? At the level lower to the system, that's important. At the level above this, the kind of resource system itself it is, is important. The governance system, again, at the level above becomes very important. Is it, um, is it a city municipality that's governing it? Is it state laws that are governing it? Is it national laws that are governing the system? Or is it a corporate that has bought carbon credits and so someone in, uh, let's say, Norway is governing something that happens in Nigeria? So what's the governance system that is here? And then the actors at the level below it. Is it an indigenous tribe? Is it a group that is uh, related to the, that has very close links to the market, that harvests for the market? Is it extraordinarily unequal in terms of you have a tribal leader and then you have a number of very poor people and the tribal leader takes the decisions? Or is it a, a very heterogeneous, a homogeneous community where everyone is uh, relatively similar in socioeconomic attributes? You know, so that nature of the actors determine it at the level above. 
I'll end with actually uh, something by Allen and Starr. But if if you look at polycentric uh, governance, it it adopts a lot from hierarchy theory, which is another theory used in complex systems research, which essentially says that if you are interested in understanding what takes place at one level, you look at the level above and you look at the level below, and so you look at what's happening in your resource governance system or whatever governance system it is but look at what's influencing it at just the level above and just the level below and then you have enough of polycentricity to make an argument about it because otherwise if you're looking at a very extraordinarily nested hierarchy it becomes too complex to look at all the possible levels and in that indeed it uh, adopts a lot from biology or medicine as a form of control because if you're looking at the human body and you want to understand why your pancreatic cells are not working you look at the pancreas and at the level above and then you look at the level below at the cells themselves and the cell biology to understand what's going out of whack with the chemicals. But you don't look at the entire human system, though you could, because it becomes extraordinarily complex. So this is the broad idea of polycentric governance. What's going on? What's going on at the level above? What's going on at the level below? With that, let's jump into my first case. What shapes reforestation in India, actually in South Asia? I started this work in. Uh, a long time ago, and I'd say roughly around 1993, because I was very interested in looking at deforestation in the Western Ghats when I started my PhD. And of course, images of deforestation were even then dominating discourse. And uh, I was very interested in understanding what shaped regrowth. And this was something I picked up much later in, in, 2000, in the year 2000 when I moved to Indiana University to work with Lynn Ostrom and other colleagues there. I realized that there was a lot of work on reforestation around the world in countries like China, Mexico, Madagascar, India. And we didn't have an understanding of what were the governance mechanisms that shaped regrowth. It wasn't simply an inverse of deforestation. For instance, if you have a market exploitation into an area, of course, you know there's going to be deforestation. But if you remove the markets, you take away that road, does that mean you have forest recovery? Because no, that's not necessarily true. So you need to, or you always have to remove the roads and de-develop an area to be to reforestation. That's also not true. So what are the factors, the institutional factors that shape regrowth? And uh, this is a book that we put together looking at the drivers of institutional change and especially of regrowth. But broadly, what we found was there were at that time three described pathways. One was what takes place in Eastern Europe, that is people move to cities, they abandon rural areas and there's regrowth. So it's sort of regrowth by accident. The second is regrowth because of forest scarcity, which is more plantations. It's not really forests. People plant trees to take care of timber because farmers need timber. And that is government sponsored. And that was show, been shown in, in India, Vietnam, and China. And the third is the environmental Kuznets curve, which I'm sure many people here are most familiar with, with the idea that a country reaches a stage of development and prosperity, and then you can regrow your forest. Till then, you can't pay attention to the environment. But we knew that a lot was going on in places that had not yet reached the environmental Kuznets curve level of uh, growth, economic growth, where it was not forest scarcity or timber oriented, but there were biodiverse plantations. And there was urbanization, but urbanization wasn't leading to regrowth. Uh, this, they weren't uh, abandoned villages. They were actually thriving rural areas, which were also protecting forests. And that led us to understand that there wasn't enough attention being played to the roles of the commons or the community in reforestation. So what shapes that? We knew that many landscapes, if you start looking at them, consider they, they might be landscapes in a particular region. They are a mix, nevertheless, of some patches of forest that are degrading, some patches of forest that are regrowing, and some that are more or less staying the same. And they all have the same governance regime. So what is this idea that a monolithic or a mononucleated type of governance regime to lead to one kind of outcomes? It's clearly not so. So we started seeing how we could understand forests that were diverse in ecology and society, social arrangements, but maybe the institutional arrangements were relatively homogeneous, and trying to understand how to unravel the incentives of diverse actors. And one of the first things we realized is you can't do this through uh, one approach. You need mixed methods analysis to study polycentricity. So I think that's been one, my one learning over the past close to 25, 30 years of this, that looking at polycentric outcomes, you are need to understand. For instance, you need to have remote sensing and spatial analysis to look at what is going on in different parts of a landscape. 
you need to have gis and geology and forest cover and biodiversity studies to understand why certain kinds of forests or certain kinds of water systems are different and then you need to understand institutions and rules which means you need to go out and talk to people which is often very qualitative analysis it's not something that you do only with numbers but spending a lot of time with people and understanding why they do what they do okay. so what did we do uh, i'll give you an example from india and i'll give you an example from nepal uh, India has a protected area system that uh, follows relatively well in spirit from the British colonial system, which came from the German system, which uh, is an idea of uh, protecting hard protection of areas. Uh, so there's a forest uh, protected area. This is the Taroba Andri Tiger Reserve, which is a very important tiger reserve in, uh, in central India. The black area is the tiger reserve. The blue dots are six villages which were at the time of the study within the forest landscape. Indigenous tribal communities that live within this forest uh, through special arrangements because the protected areas of a tiger reserve category are not supposed to have people within them. So they're allowed to use the forest but with a great deal of restrictions on where they can go and what they can do in terms of how much they can harvest from this landscape. The red dots are 53 villages around the periphery of this landscape within a 10 kilometer radius of outside the park. They are mixed. They have some tribal communities, but a lot of non-tribal groups. They also come in and harvest products from the forest, but they're not allowed to. So they come and sort of nibble in at the periphery with very large uh, sets of animals and grazing, as you can see here. There's a lot of mining. There are roads that cut through this area. There are small towns, which are now very large towns, which extract wood from this region. And the 53 villages at the periphery actually take products and for sale, whereas the six villages within the park harvest only for their own local use. It's not related to the market. So we did studies of biodiversity and land cover change. This is how the park is governed. This is what you get as soon as you get into the park. It's the tiger and it says Suswagatam, which is welcome to the tiger reserve. But the welcome board is very clear that you you have to you you could be a tourist and enter certain areas, but local the indigenous communities within them are extraordinarily impoverished. And as I speak today, two of them, two of the six villages have already been resettled outside the park. Some wanted to go back after resettlement uh, because they were not satisfied with their conditions, but have not been able to go back. And there was actually a case of firing and some deaths, and it's been a, it's a bad conflict situation. So what we did was we did a remote sensing analysis of changes over time uh, in this area, and we divided the park into three regions, just around the blue dots, that is what's happening to the interior villages. Around the park, just at the periphery that is close to the red dots, what's happening to the area impacted by the exterior villages. And then the third area, which is neither impacted by the interior nor the exterior villages. Right? So it's the same park, it's governed by the same mechanisms, but here's one set of areas which is actually facing human impact by the blue dots, one which is, that is the interior tribal villages, one that is facing impact from the red dots, that is the exterior villages that collect for the market, and the area, and then finally the part of the park that is relatively undisturbed. And these are the three areas that you can see. And what we found was that the most impacted was the light gray, that is the area that where the villages from the outside are collecting for timber, for sale to the markets, for they have huge amounts of cattle and goats coming in for grazing. Regeneration is impacted. There's a lot of deforestation. There is no protection of this area. There's um, the forest guards are simply ill-equipped. They don't. They can't patrol the size of the forest they are asked to. And there's a lot of conflict because some of these are violent, very, very well uh, supplied groups from the outside. You know, they come in with in large groups. So the forest guards simply can't deal with them or chase them away. What they land up doing is spending all of their energy uh, monitoring and. Uh, dealing with the small communities within the park which are actually not impacting the park that much so we found that there is a lot of forest change in within the interior of the park where the blue dot villages were but it's not really impacting biodiversity to the same extent there is you know you can really see the difference because you're not harvesting for the market and of course the areas in the gray in the middle which don't have impacts of either villages are doing extraordinarily well right but the same institutional approach is employed across all forests. What is that approach? That the park would be fine if only we could get rid of the villages inside. The only problem of forest management in this area, according to the forest department, especially at that time, was, uh, or the stated problem that they spoke of, was the idea that these communities were not willing to get resettled. All the effort was spent on 
taking the indigenous communities and resettling them. And as I said, two of those six communities, they did manage to resettle. So it's one, it's a monolithic institutional approach without recognizing that the resource system is different, the social ecological setting of the people, the actors themselves is different, the kinds of resources they harvest, the units of the forest, the resource units that they harvest from this forest is very different. It looks like the same forest. Ecologically, it's very similar. But there's a lot of variation going on because of the social ecological setting that shapes. Right? What happens in the next? We move to Nepal, and let's look at Nepal in a completely different context across the border. But it's a country where community forestry has had one of the oldest histories of government. Uh, uh, how do I put it? Government facilitation. So the government in the 1980s or thereabouts was very interested in community forestry in Nepal, initiated by local Nepali foresters and later promoted by the UNDP. And so when I went into this area, there was a plan along what was then the Royal Chitwan National Park, which is now called the Chitwan National Park. The black line, the white and the black you can see at the in the middle is the Chitwan National Park, is the Chitwan River. And everything to the south of that is a protected area. The National Park, even here, has fences and guards and occasionally guns. So that hasn't changed. But what they've done outside the park is wherever you see the black bounded forest along the river, they, uh, the UNDP set up buffer zone community forestry, which is basically you work with villages and you ask them to reforest their original grazing lands, their farming lands as a community. And the UNDP program gave them the trees, gave them the technical support. And then what happened is because this is close to the river and very rich fertile land, it reforested extraordinarily fast. Within four or five years, you could see forestry growth. And so wildlife started coming back. And then they trained the local youth in bird watching, in tiger spotting, elephant rides. You could go see a rhino. And so the community, you paid, if you came in as a tourist, you paid the community some money and they would collect income from this tourist work. And so they got an economic benefit from the park, from reforesting the landscape. And that was the idea. Now, when we went there, what we found was the first community on the left, you can see, which is green, which is highly reforested, just outside the park, uh, is the one that is, it's called the Bagmara National for, uh, uh, Buffer Zone Forest. It was at the gate. So you come into this really good road, you see the first park, community forest, that's the one you pay to, that's the one you go, and they were making a lot of money. And this money was very well designed to go back to roads, to go back to libraries, to go back to schools for the children, medical facilities and then back into protecting the forest and training the youth. So it helped in stimulating local income, but also improving local welfare. But right down the end, the very long forest that you see right at the end, which has a lot of pink, which is uh, reforestation, but also a lot of open areas that you see. It's at the end of a long bumpy road. It's not that far, it's a few kilometers, but it takes you something like two and a half to three hours to get to the other end. Why would you as a tourist take the bumpy road and go to that community forest when you could go to the one right next to the road and pay them the money? So barely anyone went there. They had a very tiny fraction of the money. They didn't get anything from community forestry. And this was not something that was clearly going to continue once UNDP left. So they're all ecologically similar, but the road makes the difference in changing the policy interest of what that governance mechanism was supposed to do, but how it filters down to the people is completely different. Right. Now move a little up into the hills, and you can see these patches in blue. That's not that far as a crow flies, but what you're doing is you're getting into the hills and you're getting into community forest program, which is no longer sponsored by UNDP, but it's the same idea. Regenerate your forests, except that you don't get tourist income, you will get income through harvest of forest products. What happens when you get the forest products? You have to wait. These are sal forests. 10, 12 years from now, you can get a really good timber harvest. What are you supposed to do in those 10, 12 years from now? It really helped the rich, richer people in the village because they were willing to wait for that long harvest. They would get a lot of money at the end of 10, 12 years. And they could create small community lodges to take the spillover traffic from the park, would come there and stay and want to experience how Nepali village life would be. But the blacksmiths left who were landless and didn't have anything to do because you stopped charcoaling and they weren't able to manage. Uh, people of certain other caste groups which were landless or which had who had grazing who depended on grazing left because grazing was no longer allowed. So this community forestry was successful for the community, but whom in the community? Only some people. So the homogeneity of I the identification of the community also didn't help. And when I talked to some forest rangers, they said that it was an excellent program initially, but then what happened was 
the government came in with these large targets and every forest ranger was told to go to a different village and you had to get sometimes as many as three pe- three user groups to sign up to community forestry in a day which obviously meant you had no time to understand that community you would go to a place get the list from the first person you met and the first person you met was likely to be the most influential person in the village which meant the poor would get left out because their names wouldn't be on the list right his friends and family would or and networks would get into the list so there was a lot of problem with the heterogeneity and there was also problem with the ecological heterogeneity because in the in the hills it takes much longer for the forest to generate than the tarai which is next to the river which is silt land so obviously forests are going to grow back very quickly so you can already see that there's so much heterogeneity in this landscape and then how do people make take care of this though so people did something extraordinarily creative in nepal when they started the community forestry program the government started it with uh, a lot of good intentions but then it started becoming successful and they saw a lot of forest regrowth and they started worrying that all this income from forest uh, from the sal forest which was extraordinarily rich in timber uh, would go away from them so they started imposing stricter and stricter restrictions on the people saying you can only get 30% of your community forestry income for yourselves and you have to use it in this way and you can do this so what communities did was they federated and they formed something called feco fund which is the federated community forestry users network of nepal which is still extraordinarily active it's very political it's an important vote maker if they go and agitate they have sit ins and protest meetings with the government and they broker deals with the government because that's a federation now at a higher polycentric level and so they use this very effectively with the government in a way that has not happened with indian community forests for instance for various reasons and because they can do this polycentric action they are able to really leverage a lot for themselves which they couldn't otherwise right now we also looked at regrowth in a number of different places and we found that if you're trying to see whether there's monitoring no along with the forest protection some areas were monit were let's say the chitwan national park was monitored by by forest guards the community forest outside was monitored but by the community monitoring made a big in, this uh, importance because for polycentric governance you need to know who's in your boundary and who's outside your boundary and who's be part of which boundary because you have different groups with different rights property rights in the same system so monitoring is extraordinarily important but what it's a little difficult to understand the stable but just to simplify it what it tells you is that if monitoring is done by the community it's low conflict because if you're a community forestry user and you walk in and you're trying to cut an extra tree or take in an extra flock of goats and sneak in at night and your own community members see you it's shaming and so you walk away and you don't fight with them but if it's a forest guard you might bribe the guard you might fight with the guard you don't accept the legitimacy of the guard and so there's a lot of conflict so monitoring helps but who does the monitoring makes a big difference is it within your group is it someone from outside your group so what does this tell us protecting forested land through an external agency that is the government or the market force is possible but it's very costly costly not just in terms of money but costly in terms of goodwill it's going to very likely be strongly resisted locally it may be counterproductive it requires sustained investment in guards and guns and fences it tends to reduce trust and cooperation so where is it it's not that it's not appropriate but it's appropriate in some cases if you have a very large tract of relatively isolated land and let's say you want to prevent uh, uh, mining from coming in or something else insurgent communities from taking over or uh, drug d- dealers who are going to cut down the forest which happens in parts of central america then it makes sense possibly to do this in other cases involvements of local users become very important and once you ignore that you banish trust but on the other hand identifying this the community is also very important so take any forested area it's an interaction between communities and the governments if that community is extremely inequal and badly managed within it you might find that the forest is protected but the poorest like the blacksmiths have to leave and then you have to have the government coming in with norms and rules and values that say that certain people are part of the community and need to be protected unless you have that it's not going to work so just like a strictly protected government park is not a guarantee of effective protection a community conservation by itself is not a guarantee or a panacea either and what you really need is a communities to federate and communities to work with the parks or the government and co- government to work with the people 
And the third thing factor that comes in now, of course, which wasn't such a factor when I was doing my studies is the market, because I think even in, in all distant areas now, the market through external, whether it's carbon credits and tree planting, or it is roads and uh, commerce, or it's plantations and growing coffee or whatever it is, becomes a real force in these areas. And so you must have park uh, governments, communities, and the market actually talking to each other, trying to come up with consolidated solutions. And I'll just, I mean, this is a very long slide, but if you just look at the last thing, forcing rules onto reluctant communities is always going to be counterproductive. So you have to work out polycentric arrangements in discussion, which takes time. And they, taking that time to actually do this becomes very important. So following on this, what else is important, seems to be important for polycentric governance was one more study I did with 55 forests in Nepal. And uh, sorry, I'm just running out of charge. So I'm just going to charge now. Yes. And uh, looking at a number of different institutional variables. And what I found were two variables was extraordinarily important in maintaining community governance. One is the size of the forest. And you can see that there is a lot of reforestation when the group, when the size of the community related to the size of the forest, they protect moderate. Too many people and defining the community becomes difficult. It's a heterogeneous community. It tends to break apart. People talk across each other. They don't all come to the same meeting. And we've all seen this. If you have a, if you have a faculty meeting with too many people, it's chaotic, for instance, and different people coming in at different times. And if you have too few, you're not going to get the work done. So there is an in-between size, which is very important, related to the amount of work that needs to be done, which is the size of the forest. It's not the size of the community per se, but the size of the community related to the size of the forest. And the second, so intermediate sizes in Nepal, at least 5 to 15 people per hectare seem to be uh, optimal. And the second was monitoring. Uh, this is community monitoring by the community themselves. But even that, it needs to be seasonal, not it's, it's Seasonal monitoring is the most effective, not year-round monitoring. And what does this tell us? Community monitoring is important because it gives you more local legitimacy and it's uh, socially sanctioned. But what it is, is if you monitor too much, nobody likes to be looked over their shoulder all the time. Even you know the, the best intention, people want to sneak in once in a while into the forest and break the rules. They might need to. These are very poor people. So leave a, turn a blind eye to an occasional extra goat into the forest or an ex, extra tree chopped or some few branches taken away for you or some extra grass for thatching your house and things work. Over monitor and the system collapses. Under monitor and the system collapses. Do enough monitoring that you can't get away as a frequent, you know, someone who's doing frequent interactions. But it's not that it's such a strict system that the first time you monitor, you, you know, sanction, you come down hard. And this is the problem of government rules because they're universal. The first time there's a first strike, which is as bad as a third strike. And so what happens is then people are offended and they say, all I took was one something. You know, it's like taking one loaf of bread and getting slammed with a jail sentence. So this graduated sanctions become important. And there are a lot of factors along with this. I don't have the time to talk about this in detail. It's fascinating, but I'd be happy to answer questions on this later. But what this does tell us is that to understand polycentricity, you needed a whole bunch of methods. We needed to look at vegetation indices from remote sensing to understand change variation in forest quality monitoring. We needed remote sensing to study land cover change. We needed forest plots to look at biodiversity. We need to look at landscape ecology to look at fragmentation. We needed socioeconomic surveys to look at the demand on the park. We needed comprehensive interviews with people to understand why they did what they did. So none of this is in. So to understand polycentricity, you really need mixed methods. Uh, I'll move to cities now. And we know that by 2050, we're going to be a world that is 75% urban. We're already a world that is more than 50% urban. And so we're not going to protect our distant forests unless we can figure out how to fix our cities because the connection between cities and forests is so intense in the era of the Anthropocene. And I started looking at forest change in uh, at, at ecological change in cities about uh, 16 years ago. And that constitutes a great part of my work today. So this is work in Bangalore. As I was telling you, this is my city. And this is the network of lakes that you have. And the box is where I live, the network of these two large lakes that has got flooded and waters on the roads everywhere. I'd encourage you to Google the Bangalore floods if you're interested in seeing what's been going on with Bangalore in the past few days. These lakes were co-produced systems set up by uh, kings and communities. And there's, for instance, an inscription from 870 AD, which talks about the setting up of a lake called Agara Lake. 
there are a number of inscriptions of this la these these lake systems along the way i'll start with a, a discussion of what happened to a bus stand bangalore's largest bus stand which used to be the dharmam buddhi lake and this is work uh, led by hita unnikrishnan uh, a former phd student of mine and now a colleague working at sheffield university and uh, this is the bus stand used to be one of bangalore's largest lakes and you can see on the left side the lake itself the dharmam buddhi lake and you can see the blue lake at the center in uh, the in 1885 and then by 1883 uh, by nice sorry 1973 all the lakes in the center of the city have disappeared and the lake is now in green the kempegowda bus stand kempegowda being the founder of the city it's a very complex history i can start deal, digging into it in more detail but essentially what it was was these lakes bangalore is water starved you don't have a perennial source of water and so these were wetlands that were constructed by dig, scooping out mud they were seasonal and they were used for rainwater harvesting essentially and they supplied agriculture as well as people's needs and then in the 16th century the the town the market town of bangalore was formed and as it grew and more and more people came into the town they created more and more lakes and they were connected to each other topologically that is a lake that filled up it's a slightly it's an undulating terrain it's on a plateau so when you have more water and the lake fills up at the higher end you have water that flows down to the next lake and the next lake and the next lake ensuring the idea was every drop of water would be conserved in this semi arid environment because that's the only way people could live and this continued till the 1890s when a series of droughts led the government to actually start importing piped water from distant lakes from a dam and a reservoir once that came in the importance of lakes had had gone from memory and because you had piped water coming out from the outside so why did you need the lakes from the center so the entire discourse became around lakes as malarial swamps the colonial view of these lakes as wetlands as cesspools of uh, fecal matter and sewage all came in and so the colonial view of the sanitary city spread and so all of these lakes were cleared and this heart of bangalore has no water systems now and water comes from the distant kaveri river 100 kilometers away and half a kilometer in height it's pumped up you can imagine the energetic cost of getting water to an area where we had our own rain water harvesting systems now destroyed so only the periphery of the city that has these lakes that as you could saw as you saw but what happened to dharmam buddhi It's a very interesting polycentric network because they were all networked, and Dharmam Budhi actually led to a series of other lakes. But what happened when these droughts uh, came about was that water from Dharmam Budhi was diverted to the Sampangi Lake, which is another lake that was dry, as well as the Sankhi Lake, which is another lake that was dry. So it was actually pumped to these lakes and taken away to feed the networks of those people there. And then the Agrahara Lake, which was polluted. had a problem with water management there so polluted water was led into dharmam buddhi lake so here's polycentricity of another kind you have one municipal city with one way of managing these which was under the city trust and the it was actually two so the mysore maharajas or the local kings had one part of the city and the british colonial government had another part of the city but they coordinated nevertheless this whole diversion of water systems to meet a drought here to meet a needs of pollution there to meet uh malaria eradication schemes in one place all of this disrupted the networks and what was once a thriving well connected system became a fragmented system and so dharmam buddhi actually disappeared well before the other lakes disappeared in this area it first became an open grazing ground then it became a place for uh, independence uh, movements many of these were meetings congress meetings were here held here cattle fairs and then eventually the lake uh, the bus stand And so this entire transformation gives you one sense of polycentricity. There were a range of events, like I described, that happened from the from eighteen seventy seven to eighteen ninety eight, which eventually led to the disappearance of the lake. And these were the different institutions involved. There was the monarchy. There were multiple villages. There were craft local institutions. Then there was the colonial outpost, which had the residency and the resident. Then you had the the Wadia kings and the Diwans. so all of this complexity that we actually dug into the archives to understand how did all these decisions lead to the disappearance of a single lake and it's an extraordinarily polycentric system and the polycentricity of it has not been acknowledged sufficiently because people to think think understand that forests to some extent are polycentric they understand that there are village institutions and people get together people tend to think of cities as very simple you have a municipality you need a strong city government to fix the problems of the city and this is something all the rhetoric in the in the newspapers of the past few days has been you the city just acted properly everything would be fine 
And what is the city? The city is this patchwork of different institutions. So Lynn Ostrom and I started looking at lakes in contemporary Bangalore a little while before she passed away. And there we were looking at the lakes, uh, applying the social ecological system to lakes in Bangalore using the same system that I talked about. And we looked at this entire chain of networks in the periphery of Bangalore, uh, which where lakes are still alive. And uh, we looked especially at the Belandur to Vartu lake system, which is the large blue lakes that you can see at the bottom of the image. And we tried to think of these as what are the barriers to uh, leadership that are institutional? What are the barriers to leadership that are uh, attributes of the lake? What are the facilitating institutional variables and what are the facilitating actor variables? And how does this lead? So we took a series of seven lakes. In these seven lakes, they're all polluted lakes. All of them had some kind of community action. So there were community groups that wanted to get together to restore the lakes. And in some, the social outcome that is there was collective action and some there was no collective action despite the community trying or despite some people in the community trying in some there was positive environmental outcomes as in the lake was restored the water quality improved in some that didn't happen so what was the reason for collective action to be strong in some place but no good environmental outcome and in other places you had a good environmental outcome and you had the local outcomes coming in and what really with this tells us that there are a number of different lakes which had the same governance structure. Again, I'm happy to go into the details. The, 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 this presentation is really not about the details, but the idea of a policy interest, which tell us the social and ecological outcomes are not always congruent. Lake size, the large lakes are very difficult to, to restore. The smaller ones are easier to restore. Connectivity. It's very hard to restore a water body when there are eight other polluted water bodies feeding into it, unless you restore the entire upstream and downstream chain. But if it's just one water body upstream and one downstream, then you can do it. The local context, is it a village that was very fragmented? Has there been a lot of resistance? Is there a lot of political economy? Are there local goons that lead it? Are there other elected representatives uh, uh, trying to get money out of restoration of these lakes? There's a lot of local context that matters. Fascinating politics, again, that I'm happy to go into. Uh, I'm also, I mean, as, as a person who's a resident of this area and has also been working on lake restoration, I think for my urban examples, I have a much better idea of the real politics around it from my action and not from my research, frankly. And some of this is stuff I'll never be able to publish because if I published, I couldn't work in this, in this area. But the community city state relationships also matter. What is the state of Karnataka doing? What does the city of Bangalore want? And what does the local community resident around that lake want to do with this? All of this comes together to really tell you is that lake, if there is going to be collective action, and if that collective action is going to lead to positive environmental change in that lake or not. So it's again, uh, cities are extraordinarily polycentric. I did not expect this to be the case when I moved from forest to city, but I find it's actually much more complex. In some sense, it makes sense. So I'll wrap up. I'm close to 45 minutes. Uh, to get back to one of my favorite books, if people have not read this, it was extraordinarily influential for me moving into ecology in uh, 1993, Allen and Starr, Hierarchy Theory. And this talks about uh, nested hierarchies. So polycentric systems can be nested or non-nested. Nested as in, you know, that system at the top completely uh, captures systems below. But non-nested hierarchies are cases where you have, let's take Bangalore. The water supply and sewerage system owns the lakes. The uh, municipality owns the revenue land around it. The uh, lake authority, lake development authority, uh, owns the fishing rights to the lakes, which they can rent out to the fishers. So they're all at the same level. So it's a non-nested hierarchy in the Bangalore lake system. So you can have a nested hierarchy and a non-nested hierarchy. But it's Allen and Starr who really said that if you're looking at level zero, and that's the level of your interest, you need to look at level one and you need to look at level minus one. And level minus one, you look to understand what are the components of your system? What are the mechanisms? And what are the initiating conditions? And you look at the level plus one to understand boundary conditions, to understand what are the outcome variables and containment. But boundary conditions become very important because as you know, and as uh, Lynn and I described in our paper on polycentric forest governance, boundary conditions are almost one of the most important factors of understanding polycentricity because it's very critical when you have overlapping institutions for people to identify themselves as being in which boundary, which institution are you part of or are you part of multiple institutions. And so those boundary rules which indicate who's in and who's out, if they're not clear, 
it becomes very difficult but as you know once yeah. i was talking to lynn about uh, uh, governance of lakes in bangalore and i was saying it was complaining really that it is a very extraordinarily complex system and she said but it's because it's complex that users get to manage because you really that flexibility allows you to uh, as you there is an indian english word which is called adjust and you can adjust really if you go to the municipality and they're not helpful you go to the water supply department maybe you find an official there who's helpful if you don't you go to the groundwater control department maybe you find someone there if you don't find you keep going from place to place and eventually because these boundaries are fuzzy and everyone has power you find someone who is helpful and through that someone who's helpful you've adjusted and got your work done so polycentricity can be useful polycentricity can be harmful and it's just but un, without understanding it you really cannot understand what to do with institutional governance of natural resources so with that um, single level as, uh, assumptions of governance of resources fail to explain reality you must study polycentric governance and to do that you have to do this using multiple methods to un, to get a fuller explanation and unless you get this fuller explanation you will not get diagnostic solutions and you can't move towards action I close with memory of Lynn, with whom a lot of these ideas, and because of whom a lot of these ideas were developed for our Tuesday conversations, which we had over many years, and with this last photograph of her again at the lake with her jackfruit tree. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, that was fantastic. I am sure there's a lot of people in the audience that have questions, and I would like. I will try to organize it as I can. Um, so who would like to come first? I don't see hands up. Oh, yeah, Eva Mickler, please. Uh, you've got the floor. If, oh, you, you've lowered your hand. OK, let's see who else is there. Um, there's also a question in the chat. Uh, Sean, would you like to read it aloud, please? So my question is, is the way you use the term polycentric governance, always consistent with the context and conditions identified for achieving self-governance of common pool resources by Ostrom, when they are governing agents not dependent upon the common pool resources for their survival, like a government? Yeah, I think that's a great question. So I, I think my um, definitions would be more consistent with the social ecological systems framework. Because the uh, common pool resources, the, the design principles, which I'm assuming is what you're asking about, are for yes. really common pool resources by users dependent on the commons which, with long, stable, enduring systems, which is not the case in the city, for instance. So it's exactly. the social ecological systems framework. And that's why the diagram there was the, of the action network and the social ecological systems framework, not the, CP, not the CPR so much. So there is a slight difference. There's some you know, issues like boundary rules, for instance, the definitions would be congruent. Certain other definitions would be very different because it's not, yeah, you don't have a, a governing agent that is completely dependent on the CPR. Thank you. And that distinction is very important, really. It's fundamental to the core. Well, that's right. If you're trying to achieve this, if, if you're trying to re replicate self-governance, and the case studies don't really bear relevance to that, and that's what our Indigenous Australians achieve without market or state for 65,000 years. Right. And, and in a case like urbanizing India, because you do have some of, it's a mix. You still have communities that are dependent on these resources for their survival. And then you have other communities for whom it's part of the same system. I mean, they're now part of the same community who want to use it for jogging or walking. And then there's the government, and then there's a the real estate lobby, which is also dependent for survival, but not in, in the same way a local community would be. So it's, it's a very different situation. Yes, I was looking for examples of self-governance in the pure form that Ostrom was proposing. And my interest, my research interest is how do we achieve that in practice? So that would be closer to the Nepal forestry system the Chitwan National Park that I was showing. And uh, actually more than that, there are case studies that I didn't describe today, but uh, which are in the middle hills of Nepal, which are, uh, some of these are, at least they, their oral histories say that they're 800 years old, self-governing systems. Mm -hmm. So in that case, you know, that would really be, that would fit this, this uh, typology much more, but not the, 
that I, because again, the UNDP has come in, the government has come in, and so it's become very mixed. It's not, it's a very, it's a modified system. So that raises the question, is it possible to replicate self-governance without government? Uh, I'm sorry, Sean, I will have to stop you with that question. That was your last question, because I would like to give the opportunity to other people to also raise their questions. Thank you. But that one was really interesting. Now you left us wanting an answer for that. Yes. So um, I don't know if there are conditions that can be replicated directly. I think it would still depend on context. Of course, the design principles are the closest. And that's really the idea of the design principles. They're principles that uh, you can replicate, but they, doesn't, they don't guarantee outcomes that are going to be and uh, i think there was a so there's a, been a revision of the design principles that were done by um, michael cox and others doing some reviews so that is the closest to me of of you know that that review of the design principles of what you could do but yeah they're not going to be blueprints thank you thank you very much uh thanks also for those concise answers so we have plenty of time now for anyone else that would like to offer comments, questions, or else I will abuse my role as chair and ask my own. We have a lot of messages in the chat saying thank you and congratulations. Oh, Christian, you have your hand up. Christian Turner, would you like to step in? Yeah, sure. This is. Um... This is super fascinating. I, I really appreciate the presentation. And um, it got me thinking about um, resource situations here in the United States and uh, where we have very different kinds of uh, living uh, uh, people who live near the, I'm thinking of like the greater Yellowstone ecosystem where you have, you know, rich Hollywood people and you have longtime ranchers. And so around the world, there's just so many different circumstances where the people, where, where the effort seems to be the same as, as the one, um, uh, near you in Bangalore, where you're you're trying to kind of change the norms of resource users from the outside because what they're doing there connects elsewhere, um, and you'd like to take advantage, it seems, of uh, uh, of um, to take advantage of internal mechanisms for kind of discipline, like you know whether it's shame, uh, privileges, uh, shunning, um, or or kind of more direct community um, uh, app uh, applications of of punishment and reward. Um, and, and to do that, it seems like, at least in some examples, you use the, the market to kind of create winners within the community who adhere to the externally imposed norms and at least the opportunity maybe for everybody. To, so the community then kind of gains a, uh, uh, um, a set of reasons to use the mechanisms it's always had um, to reward and to punish. Um, and, um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I guess the, the question is, um, is that, uh, I'm just thinking in the United States, it, it seems like, there, you know, you need a pretty tight knit community that already exists who has those mechanisms that you're trying to incentivize through connections with the external market or, or, uh, or external uh, norms. Um, and Nepal and, and your two examples seem similar in that respect, right, that there are communities there who are taking advantage. Have you thought about that in communities where you would have to create from the ground up some mm -hmm. kind of, you know, I'm thinking of like regional councils and like American fisheries, where there was an attempt to kind of create the communities that would enforce these norms. Um, the cities anyway, would that, be, oh, yeah, yeah. I, uh, in uh, 1998, I visited Yellowstone and spent some time with Michael Gilpin, who was the ecologist then working there and got to see a little bit of this conflict. So I somewhat familiar, though a long time ago with that situation, I'd say that so it's interesting, you're saying the market was a mechanism to create trust. Um, in the Central Indian landscape that I talked about, Tadoba, one of my colleagues, Rucha Ghate, did an experiment, a behavioral economics experiment with a community leader. So it was this game where you picked up trees, paper trees, and you got a money for harvesting. Very similar to computer experiment, you do that with paper trees. And the leader always came into the room. So it was just the, the one person at a time with the experimenter, touched the, the leaf, uh, which, I mean, the paper tree, did folded his hands, prayed, and left without picking a single tree up. And so she asked him later, she said, you never picked up anything. So you didn't get it. And this is real money. This is a day's wages that they can earn. And he said, uh, no, I didn't because I'm the leader. I'm not supposed to harvest. That's where I get my moral power from. And she said, nobody would know you're just in the room with us. And he said, I would know. So 
his power or you know moral sanctioning comes from the fact that he doesn't take any money you know so you're describing somewhat uh, different cultural situations and i think that to me is the 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 reason why certain rules would not apply place to place but there would be places in the same area where you could have you know if this was an indigenous tribal community i'm sure there would be a village next door where there were wage laborers from mixed groups and their money would play a huge role in incentivizing so it really depends on the structure of that community what i think polycentricity does is it tells us how you can leverage on interaction variables right so uh, for instance in the city context you do need to in bangalore city you're creating these communities from scratch and you're creating them from groups that have never spoken to each other and are very different they don't even speak the same language literally sometimes you know you're speaking english and kannada and telugu and you can't communicate and then you had really have a problem but under those circumstances what i find polycentric tells, tells you is how do you leverage on the connection between community and government for instance to make this better so the government can, can come in and sanction a polluter which the community can't or the governor can, government can say someone who's encroaching a real estate builder has to get out but the government won't do it unless the community act, forces them to act and they can do that by shaming the government maybe by bringing in the media and strategically holding a protest or by the fishermen within the community coming and and stopping dumping because they're there at night and their fish are there at night you know so it's 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 the interactions which really explain from one, at the same level of this non overlapping non nested hierarchy that really seem to be explaining for the city what what uh, goes on i also see dan has a i was going to ask dan to step in for some of these comments because he's been looking at this for a very long time so Okay, I take silence as a no, and uh, then I move on. Uh, Dan, would did you want? Did you care to comment? No, no I, I'm just what I, I put in the chat that uh, self governance is not necessarily inconsistent with formal governance. In fact, many small local user groups formalize uh, their their governing strictures for self governance. And uh, in larger polities where you have formal governments, that doesn't necessarily rule that those those governments can be part of a general scheme of self governance for the entire polity. So that's all that yeah. only point I wanted to make. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks very much for that contribution. Uh, may I move on to Peter Bradley, who's been waiting with his hand up for a while now? Thank you. More or less, not so well. I think you would have to repeat what you're saying. Yeah. Um, thanks, Harini, for a very good presentation. As you mentioned, okay, so um, for the project, you mentioned that some of the top down approaches sort of, that were less community focused um, are more resource intensive um, and yielded less good results often. Um, with your sort of more local community forestry projects that you were mentioning, um, it sounded like they're potentially quite a lot lower um, resource. But then there was some discussion that you mentioned that as uh, one one of the uh, interventions that was put in place was quite successful initially, um, but as it went on, they um, they tried to replicate it more in other areas and and put in less time in in embedding them and getting them going, which suggests that there's the, to me that perhaps there's there's still quite high upfront costs in terms of um, getting these community forest projects going as well potentially is that is that the case or um and also if it is the case is that what potential is there to get costs down is there is a ways of innovating to try and reduce the resources required in initiating these these sort of more local um, right. community-based projects so i think the two parts of it one is that the often there are local communities that exist but when the government has targets of this kind they don't want to so it's it's institutional crowding out they don't want to identify what exists on the ground because that takes initial time to you know spend and investigate and talk to people and make sure you're talking to everybody in the to find out the communities that really exist and not someone who's trying to game the system unless you spend those upfront costs what you're often told is someone you what you often get is someone recreating a community from scratch and that's the powerful person who's trying to displace the existing community and create something as they want to show the government. So you, 
I think it's very hard to find a rural environment where there are no local institutions of self-governance. Most cases there are, I mean, unless, unless natural resources are infinite, you're going to have some systems of self-governance. So the upfront cost of the government would really be finding out what exists and how can you work with that as opposed to try and crowd it out with your own formal institutions on top. Once you do that, the costs are low. Right? So that I think is sort of what I was trying to get at. And the second thing is, uh, which I forgot to mention actually when I was talking about boundary conditions, is that an important part of polycentricity is to say that who does the work and who benefits. Those two boundaries have to match. And if someone's doing the work and someone else is benefiting and those boundaries don't match, then your entire governance system tends to break down. Yeah. And so if you can match okay. those two, then you've got uh, things in better place. So it's, it's, it's not so much uh, that, that you want it to be less costly, but you want the cost to match the benefits. Yeah, okay, great, thanks. Thank you, thanks very much. Um, let me check once more the chat. Uh, we would prefer people to speak out loud, but uh, well, perhaps connections are not allowing for that to happen. Um, let's see if there's anyone else. Um, well, I see again the contributions mostly that have been spoken out already. Would anybody else like to ask questions? Okay, then I will have one. Because <laughs> um, as, as a development scholar, I relate to what you said about monitoring, but in my experience, lots of monitoring, monitoring and evaluation reports end up in drawers. <laughs> so, well, yeah, in practice, this, this is the most typical case, I would say. So when you say, well, you need to hit the monitoring level at the right level, not too much, not too little, but I was wondering, who is this monitoring for? In other words, uh, where's, where do we place the accountability? Because you didn't, it's, it's a word that you didn't uh, refer to at all. And I was thinking, yeah, who is, who is this uh, community? Who, is it, who are these programs accountable to? So I will, I will pose that question. Thank you. I think it's a very important question, I think. And there the contrast between India and Nepal is very useful in helping to understand this. So if you look at the Nepal system, the monitors are to find within the forest to find someone who is going against the rules and it's solved at the local level. So if you find someone who's violating it, very rarely do you go to the government as an outsider. You would fix it within your community itself with all kinds of local sanctions. Lynn often used to describe a cow jail that she saw next to a village uh, panchayat office. So there's a, the head and, and there's the office and there's a little you know, a field with the jail, with a cow jail. And anyone who's found grazing their cows too often, their cow goes to the jail and everyone walks past that road and everyone knows whose cow it is. And there's a social sanctioning that was very effective, very local, very quick. It's not a report, but it's, it gets its job done. In India, it's far harder because under the, um, the, league, the system that you have for forests, forests are national property in Nepal and India, but the way that plays out is very different. And so in India, what you have is you have to go to the forest department and then to the judicial system for redressal. And the judicial system in India is severely backlogged. There are cases that are 20, 30, 40 years in, 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 the, in the system. And so what happens is actually, you know, if someone takes you to court or you take someone to court, either way, it's a punishment. Because you get caught in the court system and you have to keep going to whatever local city. It's expensive. You take days off work. It goes on for 30 years. You might die and your, you know, your children and grandchildren have to take this on. So again, they're monitoring accountable because it's not accountable, because it doesn't get resolved very quickly, because it's resolved by this external agency that is not able to provide solutions swiftly, it all breaks down. And so, yes, the, who's, who's solving the, once you do the monitoring, what happens? What are the sanctions? How, who imposes them? That becomes critical. Yeah, and sad, who learns from the monitoring? Who learns? Yeah. I don't know if you've uh, seen this. There was a, there was a report by Christopher Anderson, Lynn Ostrom and others on CEDA, the Swedish International Development Agency, which looked at the monitoring reports on the, uh, when CEDA asked them to. And what they found was when you have international development agencies that go in and you often have these large design projects that are disastrous or not as good as they should be, and you turn in the monitoring report, the person in charge of the project now is not the person who started it. So it goes into a drawer. 
So one of the things they suggested is that there must be some way of tracking it and it should feed into the performance or incentives or something of the person who initiated the projects. Mm. And unless you do that, if it's a position and not a person, the reality of the human psychology is it's going to go into that draw. Okay, I, I, I didn't mean to this to be dismissive about monitoring. It's just that no. I was thinking, yeah. Okay, great. Um, in that case, I think I will close a little bit earlier. So that gives us uh, a somewhat longer break. I would like to thank once again, Harini, for your time and your wonderful presentation. Yes, this is a moment when we will clap if we were in one room.